Chapters three and four of Just Sweethearts, a Christmas Love Story by Harry Stilwell Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three. Lent was well under way, and the first Easter displays in show windows, when on a Saturday morning King found a little note perched on the top of his office mail, which read, If you will be at the old Delmonico corner, near Union Square, Saturday at 4 p.m., you may walk with me as far as 23rd Street, on condition that you turn back there, and in the meantime ask me no questions. Don't come if the conditions don't suit. Whence she came he never knew, but as he stood waiting she appeared before him, her face radiant, her gentian eyes smiling up to his. He lifted his hat quickly and fell into step with her along the east side of Broadway. Now that the supreme moment had arrived, he raged inwardly that a species of dumbness should have seized upon him. Turning her head away, the girl laughed softly. She had no fears. The subtle instinct of her sex had informed her that it was not a contest between man and girl, but between woman and boy. The discovery pleased her, and then, smiling, she challenged him. "'Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself?' King rallied. "'This. You are to marry me, of course. That was arranged in the beginning of all things. The important thing now is to get acquainted.' Again the low, sweet laugh and upturned face. Sounds like the verdict of a fortune-teller. One of your old South Atlantic voodoos been earning a dollar. He was amazed. It was not to be the last time this girl was to amaze him. She was an amazing girl. Why place me at the South Atlantic? Oh, my! Innocent! Doesn't everybody know Charleston and Savannah brogue when they hear it? close but it was a little further down are we so distinct though nobody can imitate it i've tried the fraud was apparent my poor voice sticks i can't change it god forbid but getting back to the wedding i am in earnest and you don't even know my name i have name enough for two nor who i am i know who you will be that's enough nor if I am nice. Don't jest. Nor my profession. I may be an artist's model, soubrette, chorus girl, paid companion, waitress, manicurist, or lady's maid. She glanced down at her very homely dress. I don't care what your profession has been. I can look into your face and see that it has been honorable. It's going to be Mrs. King Dubinion. Look up. I love you. Can't you see it? Her eyes, swimming in light and laughter, met his. "'You absurd boy! Do you always make love this way? Is it the custom, a little further down, than Charleston and Savannah?' "'I have never before spoken of love to a girl. My lips have never touched a girl's. And then I have been waiting for you.' A deep flush suffused her neck and face, and for the first time she betrayed confusion. "'Don't, please,' she whispered. "'It is impossible that any man could love any girl so suddenly, and I don't like to be treated as a silly.' King had whirled suddenly and was facing her. "'Impossible? Do you know that it takes all the will-power I can exert to keep from snatching you up in my arms? I resist because I don't want to frighten you. What do I care for people, for Broadway? This is the twentieth century.' We haven't time to play guitars under windows or sit in the moonlight week after week testing our emotions. We live by faith, move by faith, faith in ourselves first, because if we are square, that's faith in God, and then by faith in our women, and when they are square, that's trust in God. We don't just meet the women he creates for us, we have known them all along. We just recognize them and take their hands in ours for eternity. My soul has been sitting at the window all my life, waiting, watching. I have found you. Name? Family? Occupation? They are hung on human beings as so many garments. 
I don't know any of yours, but I recognized you at the first glance. You are for me, and I for you, and in your heart you know it. Come, oh, come, she whispered, hurriedly paling a little. We must not stand talking on the street. See, people are beginning to stare. You are making me conspicuous. He followed her in silence, disdaining to look about him, but already regretting his outburst. It had gathered more force and emphasis than he intended. His moodiness returned. Where were all the fine things he had planned to say? What a thistle-eater he was! They had reached Madison Square. She regained composure first, and seated herself on a convenient bench. He heard again the sweet low laughter, and felt her eyes looking up to him. "'Funny, isn't it?' he questioned ruefully. "'Immense!' very prompt. "'You believe me, nevertheless?' "'Oh, I believe you do. But come, sit down and tell me about that home a little further down than Charleston and Savannah.' "'Coast?' Island, he said, rather glad of the change. Surf and all that, I suppose? Nothing finer on the ocean. Coney Island, Rockaway, Cape May, Atlantic City. Why, the surf there is a ripple compared with Cumberland and Tybee. You swim, of course. All islanders swim, like river rats. You should see the breakers at Cumberland, twenty miles of them down to Dungeness. It takes a swimmer to get through there and back when the wind is in the northeast, but it's second nature with the natives. They ride the combers like wild horses. How long have you ever been in the water, there among the wild horses? She leaned forward eagerly, her eyes searching his every feature. Ten hours once. You see, I was pretty small, and the tide took me out. But it couldn't drown me and a lumber-boat happened along. But if the boat hadn't happened along? Oh, the tide would have brought me back. Dead, maybe, but I think not. I am a floater. Some swimmers are not balanced right for floating. Women hardly ever. She gave him a friendly smile. And there is where your home is? What the war left of it, two wings of a cochina house and an unbroken view of desolation but it was home. Now you are talking sensibly. Home, that's always worth talking about. Let's quit the foolish love business. And yet it is love that makes the home. True, but think of a home where the wife was one, a stranger, by a stranger, on the street. Oh, that is strongly put. I had not thought of it that way. Better now than too late. The answer is, in my case, that you are not a stranger. Outside of every man's life there is a woman standing. Just outside, her radiance across his path. He is always conscious of her there, but he cannot see her. He finds himself striving because of her, ambitious because of her. Then one day she steps in and he recognizes her. And because of her he keeps his soul clean and face to the sunrise. Some call her the ideal, but I know her as the woman God made for me. Now you understand what I meant when I said I had waited for you all my life. What a beautiful thought! It's not my fault I met you on the street. Perhaps it may not always be on the street. You mean you will let me come to see you some day? I am not suggesting that. Then you never will? I have not said so. He relapsed into moody silence. Listen, she said, at length, picking up the loose end, you are not altogether a stranger either. Again that swift, half-mocking, upward smile. Outside of every girl's life there is a man standing, just outside, his shadow across her path. She is always conscious of him there. She knows him as the man God made for her but she cannot see him. Then one day he steps in, and she recognizes him. What a beautiful thought, he echoed, and then, down in Macon, for instance, did you recognize me? I am inclined to think I did, she answered with a faint smile. 
Nevertheless, I took you at your word and asked about you. In Macon? No, silly. What did you learn? Oh, that you are a talented young draftsman and ambitious. Also, you are a dreamer, an impetuous dreamer. You certainly are that. If I were an adventurous as well as penniless, I might marry you and take chances on your success. I could always quit, you know. But I am not an adventurous, and marriage is impossible for us. Why impossible? The sun was gone. There is a fact I can't tell you now, and you were to ask me no questions. But the fact is now insurmountable. Tell me that fact. I cannot. But on my honor, if I did, you would not want to marry me. You would leave me on the street and never return. Her face, now grave and earnest, was lifted fearlessly, and her eyes met his in sincerity. His dumb distress touched her. Her color deepened a little, the passing of a thought. The light of battle flashed in his brown eyes. Here is the limit you set, Madison Square. Here is my answer. The only fact I recognize is you have stepped into my life. You are my woman. Beautiful, come with me to the city hall for a license, and then to the minister. Yonder is a taxi. I love you. I'd just as leave marry you out of the street as out of a palace. He drew a thin circlet of gold from his finger. Here is my mother's wedding ring, almost her sole legacy to me. It goes with my faith that you are the kind of woman she was. Mist was in the eyes, turned suddenly away, and then back to him. Her face glowed with an almost unearthly light and beauty. She reached out, took the ring, kissed it, and handed it back. With reverence, she said tenderly, but I cannot wear it. There is a reason why I cannot. It's not for me now. You'll know some day. Mystified, he stood silently watching her face, and then, You'll see me again soon, won't you? Perhaps, but I am not always free. I shall have to pick a time. Now, you go back, please. I must go on. But wait, I, I, I want to thank you for that faith. It is the most beautiful thing I have ever known. It would not be hard to learn to love such a boy. She smiled divinely. Good-bye. One of them looked back after the parting. The psychologists know which. Chapter 4 Four days of suffering registered on the Southerner. In the hours when he should have been sleeping, he picked at the meshes that held him. It was true that he seemed to have always been conscious of this girl, whose vivid beauty now enslaved him. These artists have wider worlds than the common run of humans. But what fact had she in mind, which, if revealed, would make his love impossible? Who and what was she? He gathered the threads of evidence. Her time was not her own. She was, by her own admission, or so he construed it, penniless. He had met her when offices were discharging stenographers for the day, and shop-girls were beginning to start homeward. When she left him, she went in the direction of the theatre district. But why shouldn't he marry a stenographer, or an actress, or a shop-girl, or even a model, or a manicurist, or a lady's maid, if she were square? What had her occupation to do with his happiness? King was younger than his years, as are most Southerners, but he was sensitive to delicate influences. Without analysis, he knew that this girl had touched an atmosphere of refinement and was educated, and she had traveled. But what was so poor a girl doing in Charleston and Savannah and Macon? It sounded like a theatrical route. One day, on impulse, he consulted a theatrical agency and learned that Naughty Marietta had been in Macon on the 23rd of December, and Jacksonville on the 24th. He knew the opera, and had seen its array of beauties, and yet he could not figure out why, being of the Marietta company, should keep her from marrying him. But, and there came the devil's hand in his affairs, 
but these theatre girls marry so recklessly. King sat up in bed when this thought arrived, and uttered a word he had learned from his grandfather's overseer. It was not a nice word. And yet, and here a gentler voice intervened, and yet, don't you know the girl isn't married? Don't you know? Of course he knew. The girl was not married. Then what the thunder was all the row about? Father in the penitentiary? Mother scrubbing office buildings for a living? Brother a pickpocket? Sister gone to the bad? Tuberculosis? Pellagra? Not these latter, certainly. And what had the others to do with her marrying him? Nothing if he had a say-so. He dismissed them with a mental finger-snap and put his faith again in destiny. She was his woman. He would win her in spite of herself. Then on the fifth day came a little note. He was to be at the entrance to the Metropolitan Museum at one hour past high noon. He was there promptly. She descended from a bus at the corner and came to him rapidly. Inside, she said, smiling, but passing. He followed. Inside she fell back with him. Then came the quick, characteristic, upward look. The gentian eyes were troubled. "'What have you been doing to yourself, little boy? Are you working too hard?' "'Scarcely that,' he laughed, but possibly sleeping less than usual. "'And you? But why ask? You are the same radiant, beautiful girl as when I first saw you. Don't, please. I detest flattery.' The word beautiful doesn't flatter you, but I think I understand. However, if I'm not to call you that, what am I to do for a name? Can't you trust me with some little old name? My uncle calls me Billy when he finds me amiable, Bill when he is displeased, and William when he is out of all patience. You can take them, all three. You'll need them later. Miss Billy will do for me. "'Billy or nothing, sir.' "'All right. Now then, Billy, listen to me. You've been through this place?' "'Dozens of times. I suggested it because at this hour it is not frequented by—because it is apt to be uncrowded, and I want to be alone with you. Forgive me if I shock you.' "'Forgive you? Come, I know a place where few people will be passing. It is both public and private.' All right, let's go sit down and tell glad stories of live kings. Good paraphrase. Where did you learn the original? Oh, I read to an old lady friend a great deal. I'm learning lots of pretty things in books. Lightly touching her arm, he guided her to a broad seat screened by a marble group at the far end of the hall. Here is the place. Now I have a confession to make. I have not been strictly true to you. To myself. Been flirting elsewhere? The truth is, I inquired of a theatrical agency what company was in Macon on December 23rd, the day I met you, and was informed it was Naughty Marietta. That is all. Don't think I am asking you a question. It makes no difference to me if you are Marietta herself or a chorus girl. Billy gasped, and after a swift glance to his solemn face, laughed until her eyes swam in tears. "'You dear boy! No, I am not an actress. That is, professionally. I went to Jacksonville, since you want to know, as a—' uh, "'Can you stand a shock?' "'Don't tell me. I don't care to know.' She picked at a darned place in her glove. "'As the companion of an old lady. Are you very much disappointed?' "'Happy old lady,' said King fervently. "'Disappointed? I have an intense admiration for the girl who earns her own living. But, Billy, why work?' "'Don't. You have forgotten the fatal fact. But there is no fact that can be fatal to us, unless—unless unless you are already married.' She considered this a moment, her face very grave. "'And you think it possible that I might be married, and at the same time willing to meet you this way? How could you love such a person?' "'I don't think so,' said King miserably, in over his head. "'But there are only two things that could keep me from you, 
death and marriage. And believe me, Billy, you are far from dead. Then suddenly the little hand was slipped in his, and he saw his own image in the gentian eyes. King, you will let me call you that, won't you? My king. Oh, don't you understand? There must be a mystery between us. How long, the good God only knows, but it may not keep us from each other all the time. Can't we be just sweethearts till then? Don't you know I love to be with you, and, and would love you if I might? Don't you know? Don't you know, King? The inevitable happened. She was swept up in the arms of the young man, and his lips were pressed to hers. For one long moment, while the world swam about her and her heart stood still, she lay unresisting, helpless. Then he released her and leaped to his feet. "'My God!' he cried in a whisper, staring at her incredulous. "'Can you ever forgive me? I was crazy, mad. I did not know what I was doing. Billy, go! Leave me and never come back. I deserve it!' He was trembling from head to foot. She arose with slow dignity, her face very pale, and tidied her slightly disarranged dress, her eyes timidly searching the perspective ahead, and lips quivering. There was but one couple in view, and their backs were turned. "'King,' she said, "'you must promise me you'll never do that again. You must, King, or I shall have to leave you and not return.' "'I swear it. Never until you lay your head on my breast of your own free will. But presently she turned and faced him bravely, her eyes again on his. A new note was in her voice. She seemed older. King, I can't bear to see you look unhappy, and I am not a hypocrite. I forgive you because I am glad you kissed me, just once and in that way. Now, I do not doubt you cannot doubt. I do not doubt myself. King, my splendid boy, oh, this is shameful. She choked, covered her eyes with one hand, stretched the other blindly toward him, but before he could take it, was gone. He stood as she left him, looking down the vista through which she fled, but seeing nothing. Presently he pressed the back of one hand to his eyes, and then examined it in wonder. Oh, Terence, Terence, what would you give to see that? You'd blackmail me fifty years. End of chapters three and four.